Dr. Sophie Gonick is Assistant Professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU, where she teaches in the Metropolitan Studies Program. Her work examines property regimes, immigrant activism, and housing justice. She has also written about uh, new municipalism in Spain and the United States. Her first book, uh, Dispossession and Dissent, Immigrants and the Struggle for Housing in Madrid, was published by uh, Stanford University Press in 2021. Um, Dr. Gonick's talk today is entitled Contesting Dispossession, Immigrants and the Struggle for Housing in Madrid, which draws from her book, Dispossession, Dispossession and Dissent, Immigrants and the Struggle for Housing in Madrid, published through Stanford University Press in 2021. Um, so Dr. Uh, Gonick, if you're ready, I'll pass things over to you right now. Uh, thank you. This is uh, a pleasure to be here with you all. And thank you, Ranjani and Carolyn and Helena for organizing. Thank you for, to Hibba Buakar for uh, first inviting me to participate in this um, in this event and um, it, as I say it's a really pleasure it's a pleasure to be here I'm about a hundred blocks south of where you all are in um, at Columbia uh, at my own apartment hopefully my dog will behave and I won't have to um, quickly switch to headphones uh, and a microphone because it's not very comfortable but um, I'm just going to get started here and I'm, I'll look forward to your questions at the very end. Um, I'm going to talk about my new book, Dispossession and Dissent, Immigrants and the Struggle for Housing in Madrid, which I have several copies here, uh, which just came out with, with Stanford. And today's talk um, draws from this book. Uh, I realize I have to share my screen. Um, I will say this is actually, I've done a book talk now in person uh, and this is one of the first that I've done um, virtually and so it's a little just kind of figuring out the logistics is um, somewhat complicated okay there it is so contesting dispossession immigrants in the struggle for housing in Madrid is the title of today's talk um, as I said it draws from my book um, which examines the intersection of housing and migration because since the the kind of Great Recession of 2008, housing has really been at the central center, uh, has been central to a lot of critical urban scholarship that's um, examined um, the kind of consequences of crisis, in part because it's a key site that brings together the concerns of financial capital with um, the kind of wants, aspirations, and, um, and devastating experiences of everyday urban dwellers. And Spain's platform for people affected by mortgages, or PA, the Plataforma de Afectados por la Hipoteca, has captured a lot of attention precisely because it brought together ordinary citizens uh, to stand against the banks and corporate capital, in addition to catapulting activists into electoral politics, which, as uh, Ranjali mentioned in the, her introduction, I've written about elsewhere. Yet both in relation to this movement, um, the Spanish right to housing movement, and more generally in urban scholarship, uh, there has been little attention to immigrants as they navigate some of the shifting um, demands of housing markets. And even while we're kind of in a moment of unprecedented migration and mobility. Thus in dispossession and dissent, I focus on immigrant housing uh, struggles to both illuminate homeownership's capacity for dispossession against ideas of inclusion and reveal how housing crises paradoxically create opportunities for new forms of alliance making um, that can advance novel political claims. I reveal that homeownership's reliance on outside debts and the violences that those debts can incur ruptures historical attachments to the owner, ownership model and transforms it into a target of social and political protest. Immigrants, I argue, can be key catalysts for this kind of transformation and the kinds of protests that emerge in response. Um, and as we'll see today, and in relation to the Spanish anti-evictions movement, it was in fact um, Andean immigrants, that is immigrants from Ecuador and Peru, who were the ones to kind of create the, the movement that grew out of their early activism. 
I'm gonna talk about this community and how they drew upon cultures of access activism and past experiences of capitalist exploitation to rebuke the foreclosure of urban life under the tyranny of debt. Now the collapse of home ownership and the onset of financial crisis devastated the city of Madrid. I show that home ownership made both the city and its citizens. Its failure led to urban devastation, but then also to rebirth. In the case of Madrid, that rebirth was led by these, this group of immigrants from, from the Andes, many of whom were indigenous, a community that's not typically imagined as kind of at the forefront of urban politics and, um, and indeed the Spanish right to housing movement, um, but was nonetheless key in its, uh, in its formation and later success. And while this is a story that resonates throughout cities of, you know, in many places across the globe, uh, and even while conditions of indebtedness continue to proliferate, the book examines the city of Madrid. The Spanish model of urbanization is particularly acute. The economy came to depend almost entirely on construction, particularly of housing. But it's also in that city where we see spectacular urbanization, the proliferation of different forms of credit and rapid immigration occurring kind of simultaneously alongside one another within the short span of a decade from about 1998 until 2008. And today I concentrate, as I say, on the Andean and really the Ecuadorian community in particular. This is because, as I, as I outline, they were the number one immigrant community in Madrid during the boom. They were also highly organized, allowing for the spread of both homeownership and subsequent outrage, which are salient points to the story and which, to which I'll return later. Here, I want to consider a question of methods. Um, I was in Madrid when the, when the platform for people affected by mortgages first blocked first eviction in the Spanish capital. They'd already begun blocking evictions in other parts of Spain. This was 2011, shortly after the occupation of the central squares in many um, of the, throughout many of Spain's urban centers. A Lebanese Bulgarian family was supposed to be evicted that day. And yet over a hundred people, 500 people, sorry, showed up to block the police from entering the block and carrying it out. From that moment, I began to interrogate immigrant home ownership and outrage. The most visible faces of the movement were Spanish, Yet as I began to learn the rhythms and practices of this collective, I uncovered its immigrant or origins and I came to understand that Andean immigrants in particular were salient actors. Now I wasn't able to rely on official quantitative data. The Andean community began to migrate in the late 1990s following financial collapse and political upheaval in Ecuador and Peru. Their acquisition of home ownership really occurred between about 2003 and 2007, which is basically the brink of crisis. With the onset then of crisis, that crisis in 2008, many lost homes and some returned to their countries of origin. But census data on home ownership was collected only in the years of 2001 and 2011. Meanwhile, eviction data is notoriously difficult to, to locate and, um, and is kept in kind of a very ad hoc way in uh, various kind of judicial offices, local courts, um, and is incredibly diffuse. It's one of the major challenges that has confronted activists has precisely been its inability to collect authoritative data. And so the only way then to access homeownership and eviction patterns amongst this particular community is through historical and qualitative methods of inquiry. To do this, I draw on an array of historical legislation, real estate and banking advertisements, planning documents, popular culture, and parliamentary debates. I also employ ethnographic methods from over a year and a half of participant observation with Madrid's anti-evictions groups, during which I interviewed key figures um, and also carried out a number of immigrant oral histories. In considering homeownership's capacity to inspire both dispossession and novel forms of contestation, I highlight two interlocking paradoxes that kind of frame the story. Spain, similar to many other places around the world, promoted homeownership as a vehicle for both modernization and national identity. The Spanish culture of property was overwhelming. Uh, at the height of the boom, over 80% of people lived in owner-occupied housing, um, which just as a point of comparison in the United States, I don't think we've ever gotten above 
something in the 60s. Um, so it's, you know, even while it's so, so much part of this kind of like American dream, it's, uh, we actually have lower home ownership rates than in um, Spain and actually a number of Southern European and Eastern European countries. Uh, but so this meant that in a moment of rapid immigration, home ownership was the perfect vehicle to make foreigners into Spaniards. And it's here that I highlight the first paradox that instead of integrating immigrants into Spanish society, home ownership instead increased differentiation. The second paradox, however, is that in losing home ownership, immigrants remade the political arena, claiming rights and recognition. From the collapse of a model meant to integrate, immigrants instead demanded inclusion. Central to both paradoxes, I argue, are the strong communal ties that bound together the Andean community in the city of Madrid. Those ties spread credit, then they spread vulnerability, and finally they spread outrage. So throughout today, the talk today, I kind of interspersed these paintings from um, Antonio Lopez Garcia, uh, partly because I like them and I think they, they do a very good job of evoking a particular um, dynamic of uh, Madrid's urbanism. And, but they're also gonna contribute to an argument that I'm gonna come back to at the very end. Uh, so think of them as kind of visual interludes. So today I'm going to first think about questions of home ownership and urbanization from Madrid's more recent history against the longer kind of urban um, and built uh, trajectory of change. I'm then going to zoom in on the Andean community. Then I kind of go in even further to uh, examine their experiences of crisis. Um, and then I stuck back to consider how they were the first to uh, reframe their experiences of economic crisis into a political claim. And finally, I'm gonna conclude by thinking about some of the lessons or resonances that this, this case might offer for other, uh, other kind of urban trends that we see um, in many parts of, of the globe. So Madrid has long been kind of a source of consternation within broader Spanish cultural uh, currents. During the golden age, uh, that is the age of colonization in the kind of 1500s um, and before, it became the capital really in name only for its strategic position here at the very center of the country. Um, across its history then, policymakers, writers, artists, and philosophers lamented its insignificant urbanism. It lacked the rich history of nearby Toledo, or the industrial might and sweeping vistas of Madrid or Bilbao, which were much kind of stronger economically. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, So how could this kind of paltry city, you know, it's, a, it's almost a village in the center of the, the peninsula, command control over the entire nation? Following his victory in the Spanish Civil War um, in 1939, the, the general turned dictator Francisco Franco um, found a means of achieving this task. And this is an image of Madrid around the time that he took power in which it really is still a very small um, city, though it has a number of, of outlying territories uh, that he would go on to annex. So his, his uh, kind of response to the problem of Madrid's urbanization uh, was the question of home ownership which would be fomented through the construction industry. And it provided a homegrown solution to the physical and economic destruction of war and the transformation of the city. Observing a city ringed with shanty towns, he also wanted to transform proletarios or proletarians into propietarios or property owners. He entered into a Faustian bargain. Construction would be the pillar of the economy to the detriment of all other forms of industry. Property taxes from home ownership would allow other projects to take place. This would remake Madrid and indeed Spain, but meant that particularly in the city of Madrid, the urban economy was lacked any kind of diversity. But Franco also focused on another cultural question that would animate the city's built history. Namely, Madrid's place not only within Spain, uh, but also within a kind of pantheon of 
European capitals. He wanted it to be uttered in the same breath and included, in fact, in the grand tour at, alongside Paris, Berlin, or Rome. One emblematic project that was completed um, in 1958 is this building that you see right here, the Edificio España or Spain building that when completed uh, that year, it was the tallest building in all of Europe. It was a luxury hotel, even in the midst of entrenched urban poverty. It was built by developers who had gotten rich off of uh, building middle-class housing estates throughout the city, often for, um, for members of the army. Throughout its 20th century history, the city continued to emphasize such spectacular urbanism that might proclaim its Europeanness. As it entered into the democratic era, audacious products, projects continued to define its urbanism. But this time, both the cultural references and the political economy of construction were decidedly international. Here we see the Torres Quillo, or the Quillo Towers, built in the northern Castilla Plaza uh, in the 1990s, which was very much emblematic of the kind of urbanization that was taking place um, in, in the kind of democratic era of Spain, which begins in the late 70s. Uh, this was built on land that was owned by families who had gotten rich under the Franco regime and with ties to um, Opus Dei and the kind of emerging technocratic um, expertise and, um, and industry that was that made people a lot of money in the later half of the, the Franco um, era. It was financed with Kuwaiti oil dollars um, and built on land uh, and pardon me and designed by the architect Philip Johnson. When these buildings were built and finished, they were christened the, the Puerta de Europa or the Gate of Europe leading both geographically and metaphorically toward that kind of like promised land of uh, modernity and cosmopolitanism. And yet by the 1990s, all available land in the city and in much of the country too, uh, had been urbanized and the economy was faltering. How to carry out this broader project of Europeanization, which I talk about as both the, pro the project of these kind of cultural aspirations of becoming a European capital alongside the kind of um, issues of European integration, integration into the, the European Union and um, entry into the, the Eurozone and so on. Um, and so as an antidote to this problem, the conservative president, Jose Maria Asnar, immediately upon taking office in 1996, passed new land use legislation uh, that more or less allowed urbanization on most available land. Uh, this law is com commonly referred to as the urbanization of everything law. Uh, and in response, the Madrid government crafted a new general plan that sought to build to the extent of its capacity, um, expanding land surface by over 50%. The development that followed this new plan was rapacious, accelerating processes that were already underway. The historic center went from dingy to dazzling. New skyscrapers, far taller than existing stock, um, came to a light on the northern um, part of the city. And here we see them. These are the Cuatro Torres Business Center, um, which are much taller than the nearby uh, Puerta de Europa. This is this kind of new multinational um, architecture of the boom years. And actually, a couple of years ago, I came um, and gave a talk with a studio from at GSAP that was doing a project on a piece of land nearby of this, this particular site. Um, so one particular point of interest uh, was the Madrid Manzanares River project. Uh, the turn of the century philosopher and writer Miguel de Unamuno um, in you know, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century had once lamented the capital's um, river, that it was kind of a pathetic stream that couldn't compete with something like the Thames or the Seine. And so the, the conservative mayor, Ruiz Gallardón's answer to this problem almost a century later was to spend about 5 billion euros transforming this area of the city into an orderly series of manicured parks and charming pedestrian bridges. And they, they had to sink a, a huge highway underground. How do, to finance all of these projects? Well, home ownership. 
It was the construction of housing that far eclipsed these other developments. Uh, the 1990s had seen a sharp spike in demand for housing. Planners estimated the need for uh, between 120,000 and 170,000 new units. Um, they justified expanding the surface area of the city considerably. And here, what you see is this plan uh, that sought to incorporate all of this new territory at the, the edges of the city. Um, but they were all going to be basically residential neighborhoods. And planners um, decided to plan for 300,000 300, new housing units that would populate these kind of greenfield sites at the city's periphery. Um, and these are areas far from the center of the city. Here we see one of those developments as it's being constructed, um, the Ensanche de Vallecas. Uh, and we see it far, far in the distance, which I, if you're watching this on the big screen, you can probably see better. We see those four towers and the, the other leaning towers there. So this is a, this is a ways away, right? Um, they were also exp expanding the metro system, but um, not nearly at the same pace. Uh, and you know, it's here is a view then of the, that housing estate once it was completed. Um, and it's kind of literally like where the city ends, uh, where the sidewalk ends to use a Shel Silverstein-ism. Uh, and I was there several years ago and it's, it literally is like the city continues, continues, it continues and then just stops <laughs> and you're in the arid plains of Castile. Um, but you know, the idea was basically that the inhabitants of all of these new housing units would pay property taxes that would finance a lot of this other kind of specu speculative construction and um, allow the city to kind of line its coffers in perpetuity. Thus, Madrid couldn't just create new homes. It also had to create new homeowners. As new units flooded the market, so too did new instruments of consumption. With EU integration, the state passed a series of laws that allowed for um, the you know, liberalization of mortgage markets, uh, which was seen very much as part of this kind of integrating Spain into a global economy. And they also, of course, introduced securitization. Um, these new instruments in turn created new clients. The working class, young couples, and single people now had home ownership easily in their reach. They also created new jobs. Real estate agents popped up kind of on every uh, street corner your neighbors and friends suddenly were making a lot of money working in the construction se sector or in the fi you know, finance sector, real estate sector. What's more, in this particular culture of economy, of, of property rather, the mortgage allowed for a host of other kind of consumption um, opportunities because into the, the quantity of the mortgage, you could, um, you could add additional credit to, um, to purchase a new car or to renovate your house or to get a new um, furniture set or even go on a you know, luxury vacation. Um, it was in this moment that the, the housing and international aspirations of kind of being cosmopolitan European citizens converged and the culture of property produced a culture of international consumerism. And this, I love this image because, um, you know, in addition to all of the kind of heteronormative ideas that are being perpetrated in this image, there's also this house that looks absolutely like nothing, uh, like no house in Spain, but is, and it's very, very much kind of an American house, but is nonetheless kind of evokes this international, um, this international property market and the dream of, of home ownership that was at once very Spanish, but also kind of uh, embedded within these global circulations of credit and, and consumption. But Spain, even in this moment of triumphant Europeanization, when the, the, the economy was really you know, booming in many ways, but was also stagnating in other ways. So as the economy was growing, wages refused to rise. The birth rate of the city, of this country was plummeting. As such, it had to kind of find a new, um, a, a, you know, new home buyers. There was only so many home buyers that the native Spanish population could provide. So who might consume these thousands of new homes? So here Madrid needed kind of an outside, um, an outside injection of uh, residents to prop up this urban political economy. And it's here that we turn to the kind of immigrant histories of home ownership. 
And indeed, it was in the same moment of rapid urbanization and financialization that Spain suddenly became a site of massive immigration. From 2001 to 2011, the immigration population swelled 500%. So we see on the, on the top right that like the evolution of the population that's growing considerably, but a lot of that growth is just basically due to the fact that there's a huge number of immigrants who are moving to Spain. Um, and you know, after not being a country basically of immigration for many years, it suddenly becomes this major destination. And in the Madrid region, that migration is really um, is really led by uh, populations from Latin America, namely Ecuador, overwhelmingly Peru, Bolivia, Colombia. Um, so, you know, as we see, it's, you know, the fears of declining birth rates were going away, but then there, there's a whole number of other um, issues related to its, its transformation into uh, an immigrant nation, essentially. With the onset of massive immigration, the national government established norms and regulation for entry and length of stay. However, integration policy was devolved um, to local subnational arrangements and was the responsibility of regional governments. The Madrid regional government uh, conceived of integration within a very kind of traditionally economic, economically liberal framework of personal advancement and individual attainment. The onus for integration was largely placed on the figure of the immigrant herself. So today I'm focusing very much on Andean immigrants, that is immigrants from Ecuador and Peru, and we see it here as to why. Um, and I want to tell you about kind of why, how homeownership became this de facto integration policy for this particular community. And it's here that both state policy and discourse on the one hand and the experience of Andean immigrants on the other conspire to make homeownership the premier mechanism of urban incorporation. Now, South Americans by and large found themselves taking up irregular work with little legal protection. They toiled as live-in domestic caretakers, subcontractors, day laborers. Yet against the kind of irregular forms of employment that they found, they needed regular and legal housing. This is because adequate housing uh, is a prerequisite for both permanent residency and family reunification policies under immig Spanish immigration law. But the policy had increasingly privileged um, ownership, leaving the rental market very precarious um, and unregulated. Landlords were often re reluctant to, to um, rent to immigrants and re required exorbitant you know, security deposits. These employment irregularities meant people, many people lacked legal contracts, which were also prerequisites for, for rental agreements. People had to seek out alternatives. And one um, anecdote here is that I once tried to rent an apartment from somebody who quoted me two prices. One price was if he wanted, if I wanted to have a formal contract and that was about 1200 euros. And another price was if I wanted to rent it under the table and it was gonna be 800 euros. Um, and of course, the the landlord who with whom I was speaking was somebody who worked um, within the uh, the Treasury Department of Spain, and so I just love that that you know the tax man who cheats on his own taxes, uh, which is kind of emblematic of uh, something. Um, so anyway, at the same time that this, you know, the, the state was very eager to direct immigrant funds into productive circles of the national economy. Politicians bemoan the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of euros leaving the country um, in remittances destined for elsewhere. They worried that they had no control over this, these funds and how they were used in places like Ecuador. More worrying still was that immigrants who had shown great capacity to save were not spending their hard earned cash within the Spanish economy. Home ownership, however, was the site par excellence for immigrant investment. And indeed, banks and real estate agencies were also eager to access immigrant economies and provided the solution to uh, the problem of adequate housing. The banking in industry had already come to see immigrants as a potent new um, trove of clientele. Here we see the bank had its arms wide open and welcome. 
Calling cards and remittances services had penetrated these communities early on, establishing trust. The deregulation of the financial industry allowed for the proliferation of entities that explicitly catered to immigrant populations. Eduardo, a great Ecuadorian who once worked construction, detailed to me how real estate agents would haunt building sites during lunch breaks and after work, hounding, handing out enticing offers like candy. With these offers, the laborers themselves could now take part in the city that they helped produce. Publicity campaigns appealed to migrant clients with images of domesticity, mainstream notions of kind of and heteronormative notions of uh, normalcy and, um, and traditional ideals of hearth and home. While state practice and discourse could often read delinquency and deviancy into immigrant life, which I talk about extensively in the book, these campaigns presented a different reality. For example, we see this particular ad where we have a young couple dreaming of their future and um, the house of their dreams at the best price with the depiction of the kind of ideal family, um, uh, even though they're blue. Um, but so it's kind of tapping into these aspirations uh, that immigrants had um, and that, you know, the readers of Latino, which is a, a, a publication that was destined for the, that was handed out for free to Latin American uh, immigrants, uh, reflected these particular offer, these particular ideas of possibility, expansive opportunity, and an imagined future that actually reverberated with their own dreams for, for a kind of imagined urban future. Andean investment into the Spanish culture of property was facilitated by the community's dense social networks. The short, rapid onset of their migration created strong internal ties. The collective was highly organized and they had numerous civil society associations. They had bars and restaurants and weekly pilgrimages to the capital's numerous parks for sprawling barbecues. Mortgage credit thus penetrated this community easily. Through informal ties, financial entities could spread this, their product. The financial entities that catered to immigrants, of course, also had immigrants on staff. And one interlocutor um, talks about this as a kind of the, the contagion of the mortgage. So there was this, you know, was, I mean, here we are in a, a pandemic, but, but this kind of the mortgage as um, something catching that you um, couldn't escape from. Finally, South Americans were cognizant of the ways in which they had be, become in, integral to the econ this economic model. Throughout the popular press, uh, both catering to their community and uh, the public at large, articles frequently proclaim the ways in which migrants were sustaining this economy. We see this on the screen, you know, with the, they were not just, um, they were not just clients, but they, act, they took on this kind of the guise of the good client. They're kind of valiant economic subjects keeping the system afloat. So into the gap between immigration policy and everyday practice, homeownership not only solved many issues related to immigration and settlement, but also was easy, available, and trustworthy. It also capitalized on migrants' own dreams for both settlement and an imagined return in which they could sell their homes and make a lot of money and kind of live comfortably um, in, in their countries of origin. Thus, in the short span of a decade, home ownership became a de facto mode of incorporation into the city. And indeed, in a country in which where home ownership rates hover between 80 and 90 percent, what could be more Spanish uh, than acquisition of property? Uh, indeed, what, what would once craft proletarians into property to owners would now make foreigners into madrileños. So thus far I've detailed the experiences of immigrants against the backdrop of Madrid's decadent urbanism. Now I wanna kind of focus on the ways in which they experienced the collapse of the system. I argue here that the collapse had intimately personal consequences, which reveal our first paradox, that homeownership rather than allowing for integration instead increased differentiation. The mortgages that were offered to immigrants similar to in the United States too, had variable rates and often balloon payments. With the collapse of the economy, mortgage payments shot up. To pay monthly installments, migrants took on extra work, slaving away nights and weekends. Rather than refuge, 
Their homes were sources of stress, demanding physical and emotional energy to avoid ruin. When the mortgage in Spain passes into arrears, these homeowners soon found themselves on a blacklist that prohibits a whole, ho a whole host of economic activities and exchanges. She cannot take out a credit card, a new cell phone line, or a small loan. More damningly, Spain currently has no bankruptcy laws that would allow for a fresh start or the discharge of the debt. More damningly still is that mortgage law dictates that even after foreclosure and bank repossession, people owe the outstanding balance, which in, in fact can be passed down to your children if they don't renounce their inheritance. Having lost everything, people were also left owing hundreds of thousands of euros to the bank that had already taken their homes. They had quite literally less than nothing. Compounding economic exclusion was physical isolation. Rather than offer a means of incorporation into the city, immigrants instead found, bought homes in peripheral areas. Often these were neighborhoods abandoned by Spaniards who were able to purchase better and newer elsewhere. For example, here's a map of Madrid. This like Carabanchel. This is was a is a uh, heavily immigrant neighborhood. It was about 25% foreign born, with which in a city like Madrid is significant. Um, it's in that neighborhood, for example, that the building stock is incredibly old and decrepit. Um, many structures lack elevators and modern heating. Transportation options are limited. Um, but as housing prices continue to skyrocket, uh, people bought homes further and further afield. Um, this is actually Madrid City, but soon they were buying houses, you know, within an hour and a half, two hours, three hours from the city. Um, because you could buy more house, uh, of course, in a place like Toledo or Cesena, which are kind of exurban uh, areas of the capital, rather than Madrid proper. And thus, while they were sold these kinds of images of Madrid's glittering modernity, the re reality was in stark contrast. Vulnerability soon spread like wildfire throughout this community. The ties that allowed for the perpetration of credit were not only social, they also became financial. Banks deemed immigrants to be high-risk clients and thus required guarantors. In the heady days of housing consumption, these entities came up with several chicks in order to um, facilitate this kind of uh, these purchases. Two immigrant households might um, guarantee each other's loan, which were crossing guarantors. That's like, I'm, I'm buying a house, uh, Professor Boakar is buying a house, we both act as guarantors for one another. Uh, or you might create a loop whereby I'm uh, guaranteeing Hibba's loan, Hibba's guaranteeing Ranjani's loan, Ranjani's guaranteeing my loan. But of course, if one of us defaults, then the whole thing falls apart. Um, we're all in deep trouble. Uh, and so, you know, if, if in these conditions, the default of one household could quickly provoke a kind of chain reaction and this entire house of cards begins to crumble mix some metaphors. This is with a tool designed to integrate, to make these for, foreigners into cosmopolitan Europeans, instead increase their vulnerability and exclusion. Rather than offer redemption, homeownership instead made already precarious uh, dwellers into outsiders, crushing immediate worlds in the process. How then to combat this crushing defeat? Now we kind of enter the second paradox, which is that the collapse of this model, which was meant to um, integrate, instead prompted um, immigrants to claim recognition and reimagine their urban futures. Well, the experiences of exclusion I've just detailed, pure totalizing, um, in which I talk about at length in the book, I demonstrated how this community rallied against conditions of indebtedness. First of all, personal histories had fostered an awareness of the connection between the political, political kind of economic um, conditions and everyday do domesticities. Many of you know, many of my interlocutors, um, much of the the Andean community in Spain migrated there because of the the political and economic crises that gripped their homelands um, in the late 1990s. They left their homelands in moments of tremendous financial ruin. One interlocutor in recalling his migration to Spain told me he left a country that didn't have any international economic significance, but nonetheless was where the lords of economic science could come in to experiment with shock and austerity. 
This community had already lived through one brutal economic collapse tied inextricably to questions of indebtedness. As such, informants were personally familiar with the intimate ties that bind together these kinds of macro changes and the micro scale of the household. Uh, and also of the ways in which debt is incredibly punitive. Many Andeans had to leave behind children, which forced them to see also in very intimate ways, the ways in which politics and the economy are entwined with what we are often, what are often imagined as kind of apolitical spaces of the family and home. While many too felt this kind of, this intense sting of isolation and shame and, and, and loss, their lived histories nonetheless served to kind of contextualize and make sense of personal ruin as situated within complex landscapes. While they understood the violences of indebted ruin, several community members' uh, past activism catalyzed them into action. A key um, figure in early struggles uh, against foreclosure and eviction is the woman we see on our screen, Aida Kinatoa, uh, who once told me that solidarity is in our blood. She had been a leader in the indigenous uprisings in Ecuador that saw, you know, in advance of the um, 500th uh, anniversary of Columbus's arrival. Um, there was a lot, one of many of indigenous uprisings in which she um, was, was a key player. Um, she advocated on behalf of her community to contest brutal acts perpetrated by the national government and multinational corporations, in addition to the kind of long legacies of colonialism and um, its more recent permutations. Um, she migrated to Spain with the crisis, but she brought her activism um, along with her. She replaced one kind of peripheral identity, that of indigenous woman, for another precarious migrant worker. She worked as a cleaning lady um, and came to occupy an almost invisible role within the city's uh, you know, modernizing project as the quiet presence who took care of the house um, as other women, native Spaniards, you know, took on office jobs and suddenly had this kind of like public, public facing work. Uh, in Madrid, she got involved with Ecuadorian cultural asso associations as a means of, um, kind of advocating for her community, um, as in addition to introducing Spaniards to um, Ecuadorian culture. And she became the president of Madrid's largest Ecuadorian group, the, the CONADE, or National Coordinator for Ecuadorians in Spain. While previously she fought for indigenous rights and recognition in Ecuador, now she fought for immigrant rights and recognition in Spain. In late 2008, families, or, yeah, families started to come to her with their struggle. In this role, she could see that the, there was, that the issue of foreclosures and, and mortgage-related evictions was an issue that affected many people. Well, the media issue of mortgages were perhaps far removed from uh, both indigenous struggles and Latin American economic history. It harkened back to similar processes of wealth, power, corruption, and of course, extraction and dispossession. From that first glimmer of trouble, she responded to a collective problem, negating its individual consequences. And she had learned from the indigenous struggles, in struggles she had to get organized. The collective ties also allowed for the spread of credit and then the spread of vulnerability. Yet with crisis, those ties also pr proved a means of sharing information and collectivizing mortgage problems. On the top, we see ads um, that help spread credit through these kind of personal ties. Um, and then on the bottom, you see that uh, that this was also a tool, this newspaper um, and the kinds of social networks it relied on was also um, a tool that could be used to spread outrage. And here on the bottom is an announcement for um, uh, the first meeting to convene around mortgage issues. Um, so long before the events of the 15th of May, 2011, we just celebrated the 10th anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. In May, it was the 10th anniversary of the Indignados movement. Um, and several more months before activists in Barcelona would formally create what would become the platform for people affected by mortgages, hundreds of South American immigrants arrived at an auditorium in a far-flung um, neighborhood of the city to discuss this particular situation and put forward a solution. They alighted on the problem of debt as it crushed their community. 
They called out the complicity of the state in promoting indebtedness, signaling the porous boundaries between governance, real estate, and finance. The narratives that they developed would go on to be a central pillar of the PAUSE message on housing and urban justice. In collectivizing the pro problem, demonstrating how it emerged within a situated political economic landscape, these early dissenters channeled their fear and sorrow, guilt and shame into anger, rage, and action. Because as Eduardo noted, they had that bad habit of organizing to vindicate their rights. These early seeds of resistance, which firmly located the debtor within a terrain of power and politics, are thus embedded within a genealogy of struggle against oppression. Contesting housing disposition, dispossession emerged out of very specific spatial conditions that connected past experiences with more recent struggles against vulnerability. Such, such struggles transformed exclusion into a political claim, the wayward debtor into the afectada. By identifying themselves as people affected by mortgages, these activists embedded their condition within a landscape of decadence and ruin. And as such, they made legible the connections between their domestic situation and flows of policy, practice, corruption, and austerity. Their activism in Madrid also uncovered a lengthier paradox, one that kind of flickers as a backdrop to much of the story. And here I want to return to what I mentioned was a Franco's Faustian bargain, where he kind of promoted the construction industry um, and the construction of housing to the detriment of all other industries. This was an economic model that might allow cultural aspirations to make themselves manifest in space. Additionally, it meant that the economy swelled and the city flourished, but only so long as construction continued and people bought houses, the sole means of growing household wealth. Deep inequalities in all their sectors and indeed tremendous wage stagnation um, were masked by the audacious gains afforded through um, the ownership of property. With the collapse of the property market, those inequities have been laid bare. The country now finds itself at the bottom of many of Europe's lists. It has the worst income inequality, the highest rates of child poverty, and the most empty housing between three and four million units, even as everyday citizens are forced to go houseless. That last future is salient to our global moment. As I mentioned at the beginning, I've interspersed um, these photographs and accounts with the paintings of um, Antonio Lopez Garcia. His Madrid, while beautiful, is always empty. That emptiness makes them seem like set pieces, awaiting actors who will perform the real event. They remind us in this way that the city is not just built form, but relies on the communities that populate it. Baudelaire's flaneur, that figure of modern urbanity, requires not just the boulevards of Paris. In The Painter of Modern Life, the great Parisian prose poet wrote, the crowd is his element as the air is that of birds and water of fishes. He also requires the bustle and hustle of street life the other urban denizens, perhaps, perhaps anonymous, yet made intimates by proximity. And yet, as I illustrated in part today, it would appear that in many places around the globe, the empty scapes of Lopez Garcia are preferable to say, these kinds of the black and brown neighborhoods of Jacob, Harlo Jacob Lawrence's Harlem, which is your neighborhood in Colombia. And here I wanna again kind of zoom out and consider what the lessons are here and how this story might resonate um, with elsewhere. Homeownership is still the is central to many international development practices and urban, policy, uh, urban poverty policies, a means of pushing people onto the ladder of progress. Meanwhile, investment in residential real estate is at the forefront of financial practices, even though as we've seen this week with the um, the Evergrande story in China, um, you know, often to kind of great, you know, instability. But the combination of these trends has produced ghost bounds throughout across the globe, from new build exurbs to hollowed urban centers. These kinds of empty scapes that we see in Lopez Garcia's work are quickly becoming the new normal, either through dispossession or over urbanization. As I've written about more recently in relation to New York City, uh, which is of course where I now live, um, and 
where I can see heads and yards out my window, um, vacancy is now a common condition through many, throughout many urban centers. This vacancy is not produced uh, through capital fright, but rather capital's excesses, which have pushed everyday urban dwellers um, into crowded areas of the urban margins. As we've seen over the last year and a half, the consequences of such spatial, mis spatial mismatch is greater exposure to epidemiological risk and, of course, even death in our pandemic present. Indeed, our cities continue to be marked by categories of exclusion and massive spatial inequity. Housing movements, then, confront the reality of the city as speculative project uh, that relies on, of course, outside <laughs> debt. But to draw out the ways in which uh, urban development, as usual, is antithetical to just shelter is not sufficient. Rather, multi-ethnic and multiracial housing movements force us to contend with the differential impact of the property order. Property, they demonstrate, furthers dispossession along lines of race, gender, and migratory origin. Recent debates over rent strikes, uh, moratoria, and urban budgets reliant on property taxes demand a reckoning with dependency on private ownership as a means of financing and reproducing the city. Indeed, the pandemic has revealed the violence and dispossession of property systems upon low-income communities of immigrants, the indigenous, and people of color, a reality that many movements um, have long denounced. Struggle over shelter, struggles over shelter already confront and strive to abolish dominant modes of producing and dwelling the city, in the city. So too do they articulate more egalitarian forms of, hab of habitation. To reimagine the city, in the age of epidemiological risk and ca climate catastrophe, then collectives such as the PAW might provide blueprints for an alternative urbanism of cooperation against the tyranny of the market. Within their insurgencies and counter imaginaries, we might find and propagate hopeful, more inclusive housing and urban futures. Thank you. Here, for those of you interested in purchasing the book. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gonick, um, for your talk. And I would like to open up the session for questions. Shall I uh, escape from my screen? Oh, yes, please, if you like. Share. Yeah. Um, so as a reminder, to ask questions, participants on Zoom are encouraged to use the raise your hand feature. And um, I'll call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. Or you may also type your questions in the chat box and I can uh, lead them out. Uh, for audience in Avery 114, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. And you can ask your question directly if you like. Um, so I see a couple of com questions in the um, talk in the chat. Yes. Should I answer those first? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, okay. Read them out. Just, and wait as others collect their thoughts. Um, so the first question is: Does this study also include what is sometimes now referred to as Catalonia? Um, this is a. It does not. And this is a uh, book that's specifically about Madrid and the experiences in Madrid, um, which is in some ways very different from um, the ways in which housing struggles in Catalonia and particularly Barcelona um, articulated themselves. There has, however, been a lot of work that's been done on um, this particular movement uh, in particular, which in some ways is also, you know, there's a moment in which kind of immigrant and, and then working class activism in Madrid um, connects with some housing activism in uh, out of Barcelona to kind of become this more national movement. Um, and so people such as my colleague, Melissa Garcia Lamarca, who's in Barcelona, has done work on um, similar struggles in Barcelona and nearby Sabadell. Um, yeah, and, the, and then the geographer Jaime Palomera, 
has also done work on also specifically on Ecuadorian indebtedness in um, and housing movements in in Barcelona. Um, so this was a specific to Madrid. Um, and then with regards to the brochures, advertisement, campaigns, and marketing materials geared towards immigrants considering taking on um, home ownership. So um, I so part of this project relied on my own um, experience of living in the city during during the height of the boom. And so that's how I even knew about this particular immigrant um, publication, which was no longer in existence. I had to um, go and I spent about two weeks in the National Library of Spain, which is like basically the only place that this, this exists, um, and took terrible crappy cell phone images of a lot of the advertisements. Um, so I didn't actually get the opportunity, um, or I, I talked with some interlocutors about the kinds of images, but mostly what I do in the book is um, I read some of these images alongside the narratives that people tell me themselves about their experiences, um, in part as an effort to flesh out the, um, the kind of visual and material culture of housing acquisition during this point. But that's a really good question. And um, I, uh, and then also, you know, as I say, within the kind of oral histories, interviews, um, also participant observation that I did, um, they, you know, I'm paying attention to the ways in which they, these uh, people who are experiencing foreclosure are themselves invoking ideas around family, uh, prosperity, um, home. Uh, one of the things that I talk about in the book is actually that while, um, you know, in some ways this becomes a me mechanism for integration and the state sees it as a form of directing assets into the Spanish economy, actually what a lot of people talk about is that they're bought, they wanted to buy housing, precisely as I mentioned, so that they could sell um, their housing and you know buy a much nicer place in a place like Quito or Lima or um, you know rural areas and have a lot of you know cash left over essentially to uh, you know return and be and and live very comfortable kind of middle class lives in their countries of origin. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Stefan. Thank you, Professor Gonick. Um, I actually have a question um, okay. regarding your, your method. Uh, I think at the beginning, you sort of said that um, it's quite difficult to you know, uh, piece together this entire picture of uh, evictions because eviction data is so uh, you know, sort of fragmented um, mm -hmm. and quite uh, potentially unreliable. And I'm assuming because it deals with um, immigrants, uh, it's probably that uh, much of it is also, uh, you know, hidden from their side. I mean, they uh, potentially find it uh, better to not declare what their housing situation is. Uh, is that the case? So, so evictions and data, which now I think are collected, it's, you know, well after the events of this book, um, I think that there is now an effort to collect some sort of authoritative data on um, on evictions. Um, I and that's any eviction, whether it's an immigrant family, um, a Spanish family, you know, whether it's a second home or first home. Um, you know, one of the things that that everybody talks about in relation to this housing movement, and which I haven't talked about today, um, is the kind of process of of empowerment that people go through, such that um, and such that people are learning to narrate their own experiences. And one, I mean, and part of that, which I talk about in um, in the book, is is part of it is also learning how to. Um, it's just for themselves learning what happened to them, kind of financially, because it's an incredibly complicated process. For, you know, but you know the process from buying a house to finding yourself into foreclosure and losing the house, like, uh, and there are many different financial entities that are involved, and um, and so, so for people who have 
have kind of gotten involved, um, the kind of process of revealing their of revealing their situation is precisely you know something that they kind of go through in order to um, then be able to to take part in in resistance. Um, but yes, certainly. I mean, there's and as I detail, uh, particularly the book has a whole sentence has a whole chapter that's called debt sentences. That's about basically the experience of finding yourself kind of underwater without a um, you know with no ability to pay with foreclosure certain um, that 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 like the kind of shame and guilt and um, feelings of ruin are incredibly overwhelming um, and that indeed for immigrants they face another series of questions um, but it's not you know I think it's so yeah it, it just uh, poses a distinct challenge I think for the researcher um, but also a distinct challenge in terms of organization right in terms of the challenge of social movement um, mobilizations of uh, getting, you know, empowering people such that they can talk about these very painful experiences. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question from the audience. Uh, okay. I think two of them, actually. Um, would you like to go first? Okay. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the talk. It was really, can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm just. I'm like. I. I have no idea which, who you are in that room. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the talk. It was. It was really, uh, really enlightening. And I was just wondering. Um, early on, you showed uh, a graph of like the countries of origin, and the second country of origin was Morocco, and obviously Spain, yeah. a lot of North African immigration. So I was wondering if there were similar efforts by both the state and the lenders to like encompass uh, North African or Sub-Saharan African immigrants into this like vision of the Spanish homeowner. And if those like were visually or were visually different or had a different narrative or if they were excluded by virtue of not being like from the former colonies as it were. So if, if you encountered anything related to that community, I'd be interested to hear how it was different or similar to the Andean community. Yeah, so I mean that's it's a really that's a really interesting question. Actually, so, you know, quite simply, like in the movement itself, there wasn't nearly, but there weren't nearly as many um, Moroccan uh, families represented, and I think that's for a number of different questions. I think I mean just simply on the one hand, the, the proximity to Morocco. Um, means that it's much easier to go back and forth. Um, and I think that there, you do see like a lot more patterns of circular migration. Um, but then, you know, there's also to consider the kinds of um, Islamic attitudes towards indebtedness that um, that are very different from, um, from you know, Catholic or um, Spanish relations to debt um, that is, I think taking on debt is uh, seen as something that one does not do. And so to find oneself indebted um, and, and unable to pay, you know, there's an added kind of cultural element. Um, but it just, so I don't, you know, the, the, the fact that Moroccans were not nearly as um, present in the kind of housing movements that I was involved in just simply meant that, that they don't feature much in, if at all. Um, but certainly a lot of the same kind of, and of course the same forms of housing discrimination um, are rampant in, um, in amongst, you know, the, the, that, that community faces. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of as best I can answer that question. Um, so much, thank you. Uh, I think there's another question in the audience, please go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you detailed how uh, building for ownership is susceptible to predatory practices um, on the lending side and on the speculative building side. 
I'm wondering if you looked at uh, built for rent as another form of development, which might be less um, predatory in its behavior, just because it, it, it involves different uh, financial models and like uh, building and, a building for rental. Yeah, as opposed to building for ownership there's like so part of what um what's going on here is that the rental market is tiny and it's very unregulated and there's no there's no financial incentive whatsoever to basically build something that would then be for rent so the, the vast majority of of construction is construction for for the ownership model um and this is because of you know 70 years of uh housing policy that that completely directs all construction and also you know gives the tax breaks to home ownership allows the kind of rental market to wither and die on the vine so to speak um and and that what even you know what little spain has of social housing is also basically done under the rubric of of subsidized mortgages there's a very very small um amount of the sub, like the social housing stock that we would think of as like public housing i.e like at a very low monthly rent um and so really a lot of what you can find to rent in a city like madrid is old buildings that um you know that somebody has decided to run out to people um but it's, it's just and this has been a major problem of course in the the post um crisis era in which i would say that there's you know the, the housing crisis in madrid continues because of um uh because of sorry i just i saw a question and then i like lost my train of thought um this i I'm still, even after a year and a half of this, I'm still kind of trying to catch my bearings on Zoom. Um, so yeah, it's just to say that like the there's very little st rental housing stock. Um, you're at the mercy of landlords who want to charge what they want to charge and they're just not building rental housing. So yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I see how your proposal that Latin American migrants also about housing active tenants is, is interesting. I wonder to what extent or how migrant housing movements connected with influence or help grow the general housing movement. Um, so that's a really good question. And I don't, I don't think it's specifically, um, it's not specifically housing movements in Latin America. It was that you had people who'd experienced um, indebtedness in very particular ways and had to leave often because of it. And then also you had this influence of the indigenous, of like experiences with indigenous organizing, which were a handful of members of uh, Madrid's Andean population. Like I use the case of Aida because she's kind of the most emblematic, but there were a number of people who were involved in um, you know, she'd been involved in the indigenous uprising. I know Eduardo, who I cite today, uh, is somebody who's worked on a lot of like recent and actually has gone back to Ecuador and works with um, indigenous communities on um, water issues um, and is, you know, part indigenous himself. Um, so that it's not, you know, it's mostly, I think it was more of an orientation to particular questions of debt and extraction and dispossession rather than like, oh, it's this movement that has, this, you know, that shows up in this other movement, um, if that makes sense. Like there are, you can draw these kinds of um, like threads, I guess, uh, between previous activism and pre between, um, but one of the things that I, and I, that I ultimately say is like, I don't, there's, it's really hard to then pinpoint like why this tactic, like where does it come from? Like it shows, it's something that shows up in say a lot of different movements um, that is then, you know, finds resonance with, with various different actors um, who have these other kind of life experiences. Um, so I was, I had this conversation with, um, with a couple of more senior colleagues about the kind of idea of the follow the activist, right? And then you're not actually like in a lot of cases of following the activists, you're following these kind of uh, like anti globalization, often white men, um, but that doing these kind of like subaltern flows also produces these kind of rich geographies of politics and protests. So 
that was my answer to that. Are there others? Could I just yeah. follow up very quickly? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, no, I also, I it's guess nice like- It's nice to see you on- um, Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm also kind of wondering, you know, you, you talk about this, you talk about this kind of like indigenous led movement in Madrid, but then I imagine that you know, kind of a broader population in Madrid was also experiencing you know, the fallout from the financial crisis and you know, evictions and kind of, um, um, you know, detrimental effects of financialization of mortgages. And so I wonder what was the relationship between these kind of migrant movements in Madrid and kind of like the broader housing movement in Madrid in particular? Yeah, yeah. so so what I, what I kind of omit then is that, um, and that's where the book, and so, uh what happens is that the these migrant the migrants who are involved in and the, these Ecuadorian associations in Madrid start to get organized around the question of, of mortgage related foreclosure and evictions and it's partly because they're the first to actually face it right they're the first people to lose jobs um and at some point there's they, they're organizing they start, they make contacts with a number of different um civil society groups, including like the, the United Left, which is kind of the traditional communist party and, some other, and, and workers unions, which is how they then kind of connect with uh, some working class activism that's happening around similar issues, but in the very periphery of Madrid. And then through these kinds of itineraries of outrage and organizing, they connect with, um, and there's actually this early trip that, um, Aida Eduardo, who I um, cited, and then also um, somebody who's named Rafael Mayoral, who's now high up in Podemos, who's a lawyer. Um, they make this trip around, around Spain uh, and try to talk to different Ecuadorian communities around Spain about the issue of, of mortgages. And they, in this, they, they meet with housing activists in Barcelona. And it's actually before the creation of, um, of the paw, but it's, you know, I've never been able to say like, they were the ones that like it was through this idea that they decided to start this, you know, but so it is this kind of like confluence of people and places and time and, um, and financial ruin um, that is not, you know, yeah, again, it's like pulling apart kind of various threads um, and some of which you just can't say, you know, it was one way and then it was another way or something like, so I, I hope that, that answers that. Is there anybody else? Um, uh, yeah, I think we have time for one more question okay. uh, from the audience. Uh, Andrea, go ahead. Um, so thank you for your talk. Um, I am from Ecuador. And one of the oh, reasons cool. yeah, I wanted to come to because I know it's like a big problem. Um, so I was just like curious about the motivations for immigrants, like for example, from Latin America to go to Spain, obviously back home. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, but I, the motivation to go, to do what? To Im immigrate to Spain. Oh, okay. Obviously, yeah. back home, the situation is not great, but then based on, like, evidence, like you mentioned that they often take, like, informal roles or low-paid jobs, so I just yeah. wonder, like, and they know that this is a situation for immigrants, yeah. so I'm wondering if, like, Spanish government motivates, like, facilitates them coming or... Or if the Ecuadorian government um, like is interested in them going because they receive the money, usually they bring money back for their family. Yeah. Sent them over. So, yeah, I mean, in this at this point, I, I mean, it, so there are several things going on here. When uh, Madrid in about two thousand five, I t I talked about this. I was talking about this in an interview recently that, and I was actually considered like the third largest. Um, Ecuadorian city because there are almost half a million Ecuadorians there. Um, and it's true that like in, after the financial crisis, Ecuadorians are either migrating to and, and living in a few neighborhoods in Madrid or coming to Queens. Um, and part, so what, you know, in migration scholarship, like we talk about these kinds of chains and that, you know, somebody goes and establishes early connections there and then you know more people start going and it creates you know suddenly that you reach critical mass um i think the reasons for going to spain are that the, you know particular colonial attachments being that um there are favorable like there are favorable immigration laws uh 
two people who are coming from former colonies. Um, you obviously have the same language, um, you have same religion, but um, there's also a moment in which there is this booming economy. And even if you're taking on a you know not great job, you are actually able to earn, I mean, significantly more than what you were able to. Um, and I, in many people, ways people talk about kind of being driven out by the economic crisis of 1998, 99. Um, and so it's you know just simply a question of where then does one go? Um, and a lot of people also have, family that's gone on to more to, you know, Germany and uh, France and, and the UK. Um, but it is this kind of early, this early, very intense relationship is established between Madrid and Ecuador. Um, so, yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the behalf of GSAF and the urban planning program in particular, I'd like to thank you for presenting today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, yeah, I thank you for having me. And, you know, maybe for the next book, I can come in person. <laughs> but, yes, um, I'm hoping for that, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I, it's really a pleasure. I'm sorry that we aren't able to do this in person because I would have loved to have spoken more, particularly with grad students, um, about the kinds of projects that you're working on. Um, but it's, it's really been um, a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And everyone, please make sure you join us next week at the same time for uh, the Lips Talk by Dr. Jamie Saxon, whose talk will be on structures of local mobility in uh, Chicago.